Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. We're recording from a different place than the Hauser Neck Center in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm here with a special gentleman who I've known for many years, uh, but we got more acquainted since I moved the offices from Chicagoland to Florida, and that's Dr. Jeff Middleton. We're actually in his office here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and thank you for having us here. And uh, we're specifically here because I, Jeff and I, we haven't spent like a concentrated time just learning from each other. And anyone who tries to be an expert in something, you try to find experts in your field that maybe have a little bit different viewpoints. So I think that's why we like each other uh, and we learn from each other. But Jeff, in my opinion, has the trifecta of what you need to really heal disease. And one is you love the Lord, like you absolutely love the Lord, like your business is even called the Lord's Chiropractic. And because of that, you love people because healthcare starts with caring for people. And the and one of the most important qualities he has is that he loves the atlas. He loves the atlas. So I appreciate you, like you're obviously seeing me, like I, I'm actually now a patient of yours, but I'm interested in why you decided to specialize in just the atlas. It's one of those things where it picked me. I okay. didn't really have a choice. God has me on rails. So the biggest highlight for me is when I was 30 years old, I looked like I was dying of AIDS. That's what people thought I had because I was skin and bones, ash and gray, jaundiced yellow. I looked like I was dying. I was dying, but I just never died. So 15 months of being basically on my deathbed, and if I was asleep, you thought I was dead. Uh, it was, I mean, it was really rough. Yes, sir. Um, so I had to keep my certification going with Dr. Sweat. So I flew up to Atlanta, and I'm in a wheelchair, you know, to get around because there was no, there was, I had nothing really. And uh, Dr. Sweat videotapes people before and after from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't videotape me before because he figured I was just dying, so there was no sense in doing it. Okay. Uh, but he adjusted my atlas. I got back in the wheelchair, went, went back home. Three days later, I woke up. I mean, obviously I lived for three days. I didn't sleep for three days. But on the third morning, I woke up. I felt strength in my body. I pushed the wheelchair from the side of my bed. I got up and I walked and I thrived. I'm like, how did that work so well? Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly happened? So as technology progresses, I've been pushing the envelope, spending all of my treasure on trying to understand exactly what happened and, mm -hmm. and why, quite frankly, you'll just one person's atlas and it's a miracle. Yeah. You'll just somebody else's atlas and it's like nothing happens. Basically, your own health care problems in large measure got helped or cured, if you will, uh, from get, having your atlas in the right alignment. And then you said when you were 30, so how old are you now? I'm 57. Have you been specializing in the atlas for 27 years? Uh, I've been specializing in the atlas. That, that was one of the first things, I, not first things. Okay, the other experience, so my very first experience, it's okay. not as dramatic as the one I just told you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little embarrassing to me, quite frankly, but I'll tell the truth. The truth is, I was about ready to graduate from chiropractic school, and my low well, back- What year was that? This is 91. Okay, yeah, so like 32 years ago. So in 1991, 1990, and there, my low back was killing me. Mm -hmm. I had all my professors trying to fix my low back pain. Nothing happened. And three months before I graduated, I needed to get a job, and I could hardly walk. My back, low back is killing me. And uh, actually, I was praying over my breakfast one day at a big seminar, and there was a doctor that saw me praying. He was like, okay, you can come do a job interview for me. And that was Dr. Burt Pierce in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, at that time, you know, we had, there were a lot of people graduating and very few jobs. So me giving, just saying thanks over my meal, he let me interview. So I went and did an interview with him, and he does the atlas orthogonal procedure. So oh. he, he adjusts my atlas. My low back pain went away right there on the, it was like 50% better wow. within seconds right there on the table. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to learn how to do this. Okay. So it fixed my low back. Okay. And, and then I, follow, you know, I worked for him for a year. And then I worked for Stan Pierce Sr. for two years. And I learned as much as I could. And then I came down here and you know, it's just been. So it has been a 30 years that you've actually specialized in the Atlas. Yeah. So tell us about your practice now. Well, uh, 
you know, seek and you shall find. So mm -hmm. the Lord has basically answered my prayer. And, and, you know, I'm an Atlas orthogonist, but I'm also turned into a head and neck specialist mm -hmm. because here's the long and short of it. The Atlas goes out of place. What is it actually doing? Well, we know it seems as though it's, it's messing with the vertebral arteries. It's messing with the cerebral spinal fluid flow that goes through there. It can entrap jugular veins. Now, when you start doing that, you're going to have your whole cascade of events can be happening. The, the, the brain could be shaking too much. The vertebral artery and its uh, sequela branches could be shaking too much. Mm -hmm. and, and some people's anatomy is it's right next to the brain, so it causes all kinds of funny symptoms. Then the uh, jugular vein entrapment, I mean, you know that's going to affect the vagus nerve, and quite frankly, it can cause CSF leaks. So I think that's what my case was. I think I had a CSF leak that Dr. Sweat fixed by adjusting the atlas, taking the pressure off my jugular vein, and it took three days for me to, for the CSF leak to stop in my okay. case. Yeah. And then, you know, the brain and cord became sterile because it's not sterile when you're leaking. Basically, I'm able to document now a lot of these injuries. So I'm doing ultrasound because of you, quite frankly. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, watching your videos, I've, 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 it kind of has guided me on where to look yeah, next. That's good. And it's helped me. Uh, 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 yeah, so. Uh, Part of why I'm here is you do a kind of a venogram that's different because you know the standard person you have to order a ct angiogram for the arteries then you have to order a ct venogram for the veins but i was intrigued by you figured out a way with the center that's near your office that you could actually do both so what led to that right well it, it comes it always starts with a, a poor suffering soul in your midst and like oh my gosh how do i help them and you like you jump in the hole with them they're not alone you, you know you love them as if it's like if it's happening to you. I mean, so uh, you you kind of get led by Christ on, on what to do, and then you get passionate about it, and then you go to uh, other people in the field, like say an MRI scan center, and like I need this, and like what they they it's like a cow looking at a new gate. You want what? No, I need this. Well, I don't know. You seem to be very passionate about it. Yeah, I'll pay for it. I, I, I need I need so you. You actually invigorate them, so they're like, "All right, we're willing to do something new." Okay. And and then once you take the first step, then you oh, and then you see the next step, and the next step, and the next step, and here we are a few years later, and we've got this uh, protocol that we've kind of developed, and and it's really hard to do, by the way. I mean, we we only had one tech there that that could do it, and the other techs kept failing, and even now it's very difficult in fine tuning. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a CT angiogram with multiple venous phases. Okay. Uh, we'll do uh, a venous phase left, right. We have them jut the jaw forward because we want to know if the styloids are being mo are moving or not. Because we do an adjustment for the styloids, we adjust for the atlas. We want to look if there's any venous entrapment anywhere in there. So if somebody's atlas is out and that's the only thing they got wrong, and I put the atlas in place, I'm a hero. But if their atlas is out, causing jugular vein compression and I put it back in place and it's either unstable, it goes out the next day, and or they've got uh, omohyoid muscles. There, there's multiple entraps going through there. Yeah. Uh, you, you gotta fix everything. You're, you're not 50% better when I fix one dam. You gotta fix two or three dams sometimes, and then they're better. I think you bring up a good point. Like if the atlas is just the only problem, then that, that would be the patients who they have dramatic effects, like, like you had a dramatic effect. Like, let's yeah. be honest, you were, well, basically, you've been good to today. Like you, you got like literally just a. Well, you said you described two different atlas adjustments. The two doctors that did atlas adjustments, but it wasn't like you needed atlas adjustments all the time, right? I held Doctor Sweat's adjustment for twenty-three years. Yeah, that's what I mean. Until I was yeah. in a car accident, yeah. and then it became yeah. loose and unstable, and having to get adjusted all the time. Uh, but yeah. But there's going to be people that are watching this that have gone to different upper cervical chiropractors. And you and I have talked about nuca, <clears throat> atlas, orthogonal, and orthospinology. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get the dramatic effects. So what would you say to those people? Like, what are the other things that they may have to address? Like, it, it isn't that the person adjusted them wrongly or this or that. It's just that... There, there's, I just call them co-structural morbidities. That's what I, co-structural morbidities. It just means that you have the atlas misalignment thing, but you have these co-structural morbidities. So what are the common things that you would see that unless the person addresses it, that, you know? Right, right. 
So the, the atlas orthogonist or the upper surface, they're taking x-rays or cone beams and they're basing it on that. And they're, that's, the, that's what they're working with. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're doing contrast and we're doing in different positions and we're seeing the rest of the story, how the atlas is moving way too fast this way, way too slow that way. We'll see that the hierarchy of importance, what is it that's actually giving you your symptoms? That's a great term, hierarchy of importance. Like for one person, it's the vertebral artery and the, and the dolicolectasia, or just their anatomy is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, other person's a jugular vein compression. So you adjust somebody's atlas based on cone beam, MRI, uh, x-ray, of course. You're only getting part of the story. And, and a lot of those people will get better, but if they're not getting better, I would urge them to come down. Uh, we'll do this advanced imaging and we'll see the rest of the story and it becomes really clear. Oh, of course, that's because the jugular vein is being choked by the styloid and or this or that, and no wonder. And that's the thing you're complaining about. You know, they don't come to you because I need my atlas level. They come to you because there's something wrong and they need it fixed. And you can't be a one trick pony. You have to take a full inventory of what's going on and fix it. Here, <clears throat> let, let's just go through that. So, okay, so, because you know, you have a lot of experience, been doing it for a lot of years. So in the hierarchy of things, like if you put like, say the atlas is misaligned as number one in general, I'm just talking in general, what would be the number two, three, four, five are co-structural morbidities? We got one case now. Okay. Um, came in, I adjusted his atlas. You know, did you expect that to do something? No, Let's. but we see that you only have one jugular vein and it's choked like crazy. Oh, okay. So. Uh, again, I talked, talked a local doctor into doing the first venous stent he's ever done. He, now, he's been doing arterial stents for 30 years. Yeah. But I, so he put a, a stent and he's like, mm -hmm. I can see what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I understand now because we've been fighting with and making cases for years to our local. Anyway, so he puts a stent in there. The guy's like, I I'm a little better. Well, having that jugular vein compression there from the atlas. By the way, it was an atlas that had choked the jugular vein up. Okay. No doubt about it. Okay. But because it happened so aggressively and shut it down, he ended up with an AV fistula. So the connection between the artery and the vein got broken okay. uh, from the atlas subluxation. So he ended up, we ended up getting him to another guy and he said, oh, you got an AV fistula in there. So they repaired that. They fixed the oh, connection okay. between the high pressure artery that was inflating the low pressure vein right there above the atlas. Yeah. And he felt a little bit better there. I'm like, oh, but we by faith knew that he had a CSF leak or suspected he had a CSF leak. Because that's what happens when you back up the pressure like this, right? The CSF drains into the venous system by a pressure gradient. So you have to have low pressure venous system yeah. so the CSF can drain in there. And those metabolites are very um, irritating. irritating. Uh, these metabolites build up, you know, Parkinson's is one of them. And we believe there's ALS and a lot of other things that happen as a sequela of, of not being able to flush correctly. So we pay very close attention to these. So he just had a blood patch. And to his credit, uh, again, passionate. The patient was passionate. We've been a patient advocate for him. And that seems like what we do also. And he got a blood patch. I'm like, wow, it's actually, I think I'm feeling like a normal human being. Where did they do the, did they do the blood patch up here or just in the lumbar? It, it ended up being, they did it in the thoracic spine because that's often where they find it. Now, often in the lumbar spine and the cervical spine. So. Was that, it? Did they did they find it or they just no, suspected it? They, so you actually got somebody to do it just as a possible right, treatment. Right. CSF leaks are so difficult right, to find. Right. It's, a, just, it's a leap of faith. You got to find yeah. somebody who believes you. Okay. Because these people look. By the way, they look like hypochond yeah. hypochondriacs to a lot of the uh, yeah. populate medical population who don't aren't familiar. Okay. Right. So okay. he's going to end up doing blood patches until he gets a diminished return to where okay. he's just okay. This is okay. as good as I am. Uh, so okay. that's just one case. So. But you did that, ask. But that's a good example of like multiple. Remember just saying like, bang for the buck. What normally is it? Bang for the buck. Yeah. What is it normally? Uh, all right. Doing these 4K resolution 3D renderings of CT scans with contrast in multiple positions, whatever position provokes them the most and whatever position makes them best, and comparing them. It takes hours. I'll say spend four hours comparing this to that and, and to, to kind of go, what what is that particular person's problem? Yeah. Uh, and it's like, for example, we had a pathologist. 34 years of him turning his head from here, taking a slide, putting it in the... In, so his his mechanism w w and injuries were unique to him. So it's almost like it's an unfair question in some way because okay. some people are so unique. Okay. But I'll tell you the... I mean, the top five, you know, you think venous congestion... Okay. But as you asked bang for the buck. So the bang for the buck would be to get this comprehensive imaging that we've developed. Okay. And it'll tell us where to go next. 
Okay. Uh, and very often, you know, they'll come in, we'll adjust the atlas, we'll do the thing. And like, man, the thing that you're talking about is this huge calcification that's grown between your skull and your atlas. And that's a, a monkey wrench in the works. Or you've had that backpack that's caused your first rib to drop down. You know, mm -hmm. so we're fine. The more scans we do, the more we learn, the more yeah. we find. Okay. And I gotcha. And then obviously the styloids are a big issue. Right. Yeah. Uh, like wait, like we just had one. Right, the right. styloids got yeah. removed. As a matter of fact, yeah. she just came back yeah. yesterday. And we waited almost the, well, eight months for her to get the styloids removed. Now before we got there, yeah. it was two or three years of me shopping her around to this doctor and that yeah. doctor and like, oh, your venous congestion, it's fine, it's normal. You you only need one one vein. And there's a cognitive dissonance when you tell some doctors that you need optimum flow of, yeah. of venous drainage. Like, no, you yeah. don't. I'm like, well, if you think about CSF, but there's, anyway. Long story short, everybody's calling her normal, normal. We sent her out, we got her appointment out in Colorado. Dr. Hepworth ended up removing one of the styloids. And for the first time, she's got, I mean, she feels yeah, like a normal fantastic. human being again. Great case. Do you have an idea on the first visit that I'll need to see this person for X number of visits. You know, like, you know, there's some chiropractors yeah. who they, they do it from a visit to visit where other chiropractors are like, you know, you got to see me for 30 visits. Like what, so somebody comes to see you, well, obviously I'm going to be a you know, patient today. So how do you make the assessment of like, you, you do an adjustment or you do a treatment then? All right. So my experience is that Dr. Sweat adjusted my atlas and I held it for 23 years. Yeah. So how do I tell somebody they're gonna come back for 30 visits? I just can't do that, okay? okay? Yes, sir. I have to have criteria, I have something, I need to know you're going out of adjustment. Um, can you hold the adjustment? Okay. I mean, I don't send somebody to Prolo on the second visit because they, they couldn't hold the adjustment no. a day or two. No. All right, so I find out wh why they're going out of adjustment. Okay. Um, I, I typically say it takes about five visits for me to hand, figure out the most difficult cases, what's all the moving parts, you know, what are you doing to knock it out, what do we not okay. know? And a lot of our people, quite frankly, will come in one visit. Most people, I'll say, come in one visit. Second most amount of people come in two visits. And they're like me, almost one and done, okay. or, or you know, markedly better. That's great. And or we find, oh my gosh, your atlas is the fourth thing on the list. You gotta go get this fixed and that fixed. Okay. That's, what's so, that's what, one of the things I like about you. You know, like you're, it isn't just like everybody, it's an atlas thing and you gotta do this. Like the atlas is part of it, but you know, and I think that's probably what you like about our office too. It's like, we really do try to, if somebody needs their styloid removed, then you gotta get your styloid removed. Or there doesn't seem to be major instability. You really should try to see Jeff Middleton or another upper cervical and then work on your cervical curve. Right, and some people, their atlas goes out and they're bad, yeah. real yeah. bad. And they come in and we have to adjust their atlas. Oh, you're the greatest thing in the world, thank you. Uh, and then. But, yeah. Okay, why do you go so bad when your yeah. atlas is out? Yeah. How about we find it's a styloid or some instability yeah. or, or some... Yeah, even the jaw. Like the <clears> jaw, or the jaw. Yeah, yeah, it's different right. jaw kind of problems. We yeah. put dental appliance and people yeah. are just holding their jaw forward and that is yeah. day and night. What's in your experience the things that get somebody out of alignment? Like you do an adjustment. What sort of things do you have to be careful for when you leave the office? So one of the things I've learned is that let's just say somebody's atlas goes up to the right. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when anybody turns their head to the left, the atlas goes further to the right. Okay. So if somebody with a real high plane line, their vulnerability is turning their head to the left. So oftentimes if we can just minimize your turn to, turning to the left for about six weeks, picture it as a sprained ankle, sprained ligament, stop doing that one movement for a period of time, the ligaments will tighten up and you kind okay. of hold the adjustment better. Okay. We've seen other that have a spinous process that's kicked over and doesn't want to reduce. Mm -hmm. um, now we have seen some arthritic changes that will lock it into place, but another thing we're finding is that a, a purse on the shoulder, and slender neck females are the people we see more than anybody else. Uh, so any, a purse or anything, or a backpack, anything on one side that the spinous goes to, it can, will make the spinous kick over even more, um, and that will cause some people to knock, out, knock them out of adjustment. So it depends on their particular pattern. Those are the two biggies yeah. that I've noticed. We always think about there's the cranial cervical junction, but maybe I don't talk enough about, or other people don't talk about the cervical thoracic junction. And then how, well, I guess explain 
how you came to that, and then second is like there's a problem there, and how would that get somebody out of alignment? I guess like what, would, okay. what do you think is the mechanism? All right, <clears throat> so the radiologists are an easy target. Oh look, the radiologist missed this. The radiologist missed that. Well, I'll sit there and study these things, uh, and there are things you start to look for. Oh, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that, and you don't see other things. So you have to sit there and spend hours looking at everything. And that's when these first ribs popped out. I'm like, oh my God, or showed a popped out rib, showed, you know, you could see it. I'm like, oh my gosh, how many of these have I been missing that I got to go back and, and look at them again? Um, I like how we just shared a patient. She got her atlas adjusted. She was doing great. She went to you, you did prolo, she was happy. Yeah, for a couple of years. A yeah. couple of years. And then yeah. all of a sudden the wheels came off and, and, and it's not working anymore. And, you know, and we did the CT scan on her. Mm -hmm. And of course, what did we learn? She went back to school to be an ultrasound tech. Her, her backpack was on her first ribs, pulling the first ribs down. Now those first ribs have the scaling muscles, which help to modulate. Uh, well, the scaling muscles are not modulating correctly when the atlas, I mean, when the first ribs, when the floor drops out. Okay. Uh, and you can even muscle test somebody. You can push somebody from side to side and, and their head will have a little wobble because there's a rib out. You make an adjustment to the rib, just move it a little bit temporary as it may be, okay. and all of a sudden the scalings turn on and they're able to modulate correctly and able to stabilize and hold the, hold that gyration of head through through gait okay. a, a little bit better. That makes sense. Right, yeah. and if a muscle's turned off through you know, some sort yeah. of something like yeah. that, then the ligaments have to take up the slack. So you, if yeah. you see a loose ligament, you know, what are they doing every day? Yeah, then interesting you should say that because uh, you know, we see a lot of, you know, in the office being a prolotherapy practice or joint instability specialty clinic, brachial plexus problems. So, you know, because people are always like, well, why are my scalenes, uh, you know, hypertonic and it's irritating the brachial plexus? So obviously there's one mechanism is the first rib is an issue, you know, whether it's unstable or it's just misaligned or... Right, and the other caveat there is that yeah. when that first rib comes down, uh, different uh, anatomy books and have it the stellate ganglia in different locations. Yeah, so, you're right. Because it varies from yeah. human to per yeah, person yeah, to person. True. So if somebody's got a stellate ganglion that's really close to that first rib or slightly below it, and then they, and I can show you a case. I've got so a few, I've, I've documented a few yeah. cases on this. Um, it's going to irritate that stellate ganglion, which okay. is going to cause sympathetic stimulation, and they'll say, "Oh, my nervous system is just like yeah. this, and I can't seem to settle it down." Uh, Isn't it kind of crazy that? You know, like, you know, like, you know, stellate ganglion blocks in the 1940s and 50s was really popular. Like that was, and then when I was in training in the early, in the mid 80s, I mean, they just did stellate ganglion blocks for everything. Then it went out of vogue for like 30 years. It goes out of vogue. Then it's coming back because they, they, you know, they, these veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Like, it's unbelievable, like, they do this stellate ganglion block. So I'll get people, like, I don't go on the internet and say I do stellate ganglion blocks. But I'm telling you, the ones I've done, because the people, you know, they're already my patients, then they read something about, you know, they do a stellate ganglion block and all of a sudden their anxiety or their post-traumatic stress goes way down. So it's like, it's unbelievable sometimes. Then, and I always wonder, like, why would doing one stellate ganglion block you know what I mean? Like somebody has terrible post-traumatic stress for whatever reason, then. All right, so we, we just had somebody at Walter Reed Hospital. Okay. The, the guys in and out of Walter Reed, you know, driving the doctors yeah. nuts there. You know, they, go, they and they want yeah. to say, oh, it's this or it's that. So again, we did, a, we, we did a scan on him and his first ribs were down bad on both sides mm -hmm. from having a heavy tactical vest and then running in a heavy tactical vest. So we're, we're seeing seatbelt injuries do it. We're seeing a heavy tactical vest do it. And I mean, once you get that, those stellate, that, that thing just, you're off to the races and you don't even know what's, okay. Uh, and, and they're gonna, it's easy for the doctor. Well, I don't, you know what happens. They, they, yeah. They're told they're psychological. Of course. And especially most, people, most of these injuries are slender necked females. So yeah, uh, it, it's, they get treated a certain way. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it's even, easy to say something psychological because the person's all anxious. Like they're actually correct in that they have anxiety. No one's denying somebody has anxiety or they're all depressed. But if you had a chronic illness and nobody could help you, you would be depressed. Like it's crazy. It's crazy to say that the depression's the problem. You know, like 
if you have a chronic, like you have chronic digestive problems and nobody's, you can't digest food, you're going right. to eventually get depressed about it or anxious about it. Right. So even if you go to Walter Reed and you're a captain and you're, yeah. it's, they can still say, oh, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Uh, you're a female, you're emotional, yeah. because if they can't find it, that's kind of, yeah. so they can compartmentalize yeah. you and move on. Often when the guys come in, especially a, you know, a middle age or older age guy, like I'm over 60, so technically I'm in the last third of my life, so I'm an older guy. So you know, they done a bunch of stuff. You know, I did five Ironmans, I fell off my bike. You know, I had a very bad whiplash when I was 14 or 15. So people who come in with arthritis and they have limited motion, like from C5 to C7, like they have some arthritis, the discs are narrower compared right. to the upper part. I is is it almost now. always, does you almost always need to see a chiropractor or is there things like somebody like me could do or? All right, you wanna to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to the Lord what is the Lord's. Okay. So I'm in the gym every day because I have to have the muscle tone uh, to help so that my ligaments aren't the only thing showing up because okay. I will beat them up. Okay. So yeah, these arthritic changes are signs that, that the ligaments have gotten beat up. There's, okay. there's so much movement okay. in there. They're, the person's, uh, doing a repetitive thing. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I, I have found that if, if they exercise and train, okay. and of course there are physical therapists who are very good at, uh, like with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and, and, and getting in, finding the exact thing, and fixing that exact, okay. where, that, where, where they're too uh, uh, okay. loose, the, the muscles are hypotonic. So yeah, you, get, you gotta exercise what needs to be exercised. Okay. The, the, always having a, a, a tone, uh, yeah. Muscle uh, yeah. and, and core and everything is better than not having. Okay, so you're a strong advocate that the average person really should be in a lifestyle where motion and exercise is a part of it. Right, especially as okay. we get older, we have to have okay. muscle tone. Okay. Uh, deconditioned muscles okay. that are not helping anybody. As it relates to some calcifications, would you say they're fine to have, or? And in my case specifically, the supraspinous ligament thing, I should do something about it? Like I should try to get mobilization of that or not? Nah. Right, so when we're, we have to prayerfully consider what to go after and what to ignore. Yeah. And that's, that's difficult when it comes to the body. Do we leave this alone or do we go after it? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a conversation that the person has to decide what are they, what are they willing to go after? Uh -huh. you know, if they get a, a, a burr in their saddle or if they, I, I wanna fix that, then okay, then you go after some of these, others you ignore. Yeah. In your case particular. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we broke up the spinous calcifications between the spinous processes around T1, T2, T3, I don't think we're gonna gain anything because the discs are gone in that area, yeah, probably because yeah. it is a repetitive thing. And, and it's probably started you know, going through medical school. You're studying, you're in this yeah. position, you're in your mind, you're not well, aware of what a bad, your body Plus we had a bad car accident. Right, know. so these traumas, these ligaments. Um, right, mm -hmm. so that because the discs are already gone, and the vertebrae are approximating, uh, I think it's stopped moving in there. Okay. If you wanted to go after that and really exercise the muscles and, and okay. get you do the supermans and bring everything to bring it back, it would be a lot of work for a little bit of extra motion in there. Yeah, that's good. So there's a point of diminished return and you pick your battles. Uh, there's a book out there, Pick Your Enemies Well. <laughs> yeah. No, the notion always is, is do people need scans or not? And I think even me, because you know, I, without that scan, you know, I could have like gone crazy. Like, you know, I got to try to mobilize my thoracic spine, mobilize my, th like, you know, because you don't know this, but I did have a series of physical therapy thing where the physical therapist was correct in that doc, you, can, you know, there's no motion here. So we were doing all kinds of things. So, you know, I could just keep doing that and it turns out like, you know, I actually have a fusion. You know, I basically have some vertebrae that are fused. So scanning helps, you know, it really does help like what's possible, what's not possible. And, and that relates to shoulders or everything because you know, the whole debate is just do people really need x-rays or they don't because the old-fashioned doctors and again I was trained as an old-fashioned doctor like you just use your hands and you but and I think people know in their spirit that yeah. you know something's wrong even though the doctors are telling me just live with it or it's not that big of a deal no something's wrong and they 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 know to keep searching and keep searching and that the answer is out there and they get on the internet and they find you they find me yeah uh, I, so people I think they know in here to keep looking and of course then we find things, you know. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about 
you order brain MRIs or yeah. neck MRIs. So tell me, what are the things you kind of look at? Like, what do you look at on a brain MRI or a neck MRI that you're looking for specifically? Or, okay, yeah. so there's a saying in chiropractic that uh, we end up, well, at least the doctors that trained me, we end up doing whatever the medical doctor won't do. Okay. So the person comes to me last, or at least not first, they've already gone to a series of doctors. This is what the doctors looked at. This is what the doctors thought were important and they've hit a, a standstill. Well, then it makes it easier for me. I'm like, okay, I know what they would have done. I know what they, so now look for what they would have missed and then go after what they don't deem important, treat that and all of a sudden, oh, so that was the thing. It didn't meet a threshold okay. for them. And they're, you know, look, I don't know a medical doctor that's not super busy and dancing as fast as they can. So they, they don't, maybe they don't even want to be slowed down by some of these. It anyway, takes time. Right. You got to listen. So, right. So those people come to me, yeah. uh, come to us, yeah. and we, we spend the extra time looking for, looking for something on an MRI, looking for something on a CT scan that they don't really look for. Yeah. And what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing uh, cerebral spinal fluid pooling at the top of the head or in the bottom of the head. Um, we're, we're seeing different things. That, does this matter? Does it not matter? Well. Then we examine it, we kind of treat it, and like, oh, it did make a difference. So there's going to be findings on an MRI like there's CSF stasis. So you actually see pooling, but often that isn't, the radiologist doesn't comment on it. Because the radiologist bias might be, is there a surgical lesion here? Because, you know, like, like, let's be yeah. honest, like they got to, they have to find a tumor or a bad cyst or something right. that is so very subtle things. The subtle things like, you know, you, the radiologist did a good job on my scan because I just had these real subtle white matter lesions, but another radiologist might have missed that. Because it's not like a big overwhelming thing. Okay, look, yeah. the radiologist is an easy target. You know, mm -hmm. he's gonna miss this, he's gonna miss that. All right, you try doing that job. It's a tough job. Oh, very tough. They have to read so many scans very, right. very quickly. Right, and we had a radiologist's wife in here not too long okay. ago. And I'm like, I know they got to read. Yeah. And, and she was just, oh, well, he's got to do 20 scans an hour. Yeah. So that's three minutes a scan. Yeah, three minutes a scan. Right. right. Yeah, and yeah. he's responsible yeah. and accountable for a whole long list of things. Yeah. The insurance company's going to pay him this amount of money. Yeah, that's. He's true. accountable for this. He's already backed into a corner. Yeah. So to get him to, to, it's not. Right. He, I understand what you're saying. Right. I understand what you're saying. You have to read it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to read the it yourself. The other thing too, you probably appreciate this too. There are definitely, the radiologist does a good job. Like they might say hydrocephalus, like they'll say hydrocephalus or uh, ventriculomegaly. Mm -hmm. Like I'm thinking of a particular patient of mine. And they'll go see the neurologist sometimes and the neurologist, or if you went to a neurologist and you said you had white matter lesions and they may just say, ah, that's part of aging, right? So you and I would look at it different, right? Because we would say, Janice, you're only 42. Like you're only 42, and you got these humongous ventricles, or you have all this pooling. Right. Let's okay. say, let's just say the radiologist yeah. calls it and says, "Hey, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. I think that's important." All right. So now he's going to go to a doctor. Who's what? What is the treatment for it? Well, it's it's a shade of gray pathology. They don't really have a, a, yeah. a treatment for. It. There's nothing to. Do. You're just bog, you're bogging down the system because now the primary doctor doesn't know what to do with it. The neurologist doesn't know what to do with it. It's not bad enough for them okay. to have uh, to fit into a box. Where you and I would say, no, that's the precursor, like the white matter lesions for me, even though it's very, very subtle, it's a precursor of a disease. Right. So that, like, we should be more preventative. So I got to make sure, like, in a year or two, get another uh, MRI. And then the scan showed a new, uh, just a very subtle atherosclerosis that I have in my right carotid yeah. artery. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to get up. Normally I would get up, but you got to realize for years I've been going like this. For years, you know, like years, like, and and with prolotherapy, I mean, it's it's just a lot. It's like hours and hours of my turning my head to the right. So you could see where over many years it's like torquing the carotid artery, torquing the carotid artery, torquing the carotid artery. So I'd rather know early that I'm getting strain on my right carotid artery because my left carotid artery is totally fine. So that's why, and then if my atlas is rotated anterior on the left, then it may be 
in my work, I have to change a little bit of my posture. If we did a scan of you in that position, mm -hmm. we would see the, the, the carotid artery doing this big old loop thing. We're gonna see muscle pulling it this way. Yeah. We're gonna see maybe even some yeah. other scar tissue or adhesions. And yeah. the thing is gonna be twisted like this yeah. and your blood pressure's up and you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. I gotta get this right. Yeah, yeah. And you're exactly. not and you're and you're not locked yeah. into it. So of course we're gonna see calcification of the artery where it's trying to where, yeah. where it's getting hit. And right, I mean structure affects function and, and yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was well said. That was well, well said. And the cool thing with ultrasound, you and I can at least a little bit, you know, we can we can uh, approximate that and then we can see, you know, we can at least envision, like you said, the pulse wave changes, like the actual wave changes, like there's more pressure. So it spikes, you know, it's not like, like that, it spikes because you can see the spike, and then yeah, yeah, you do a velocity right there in yeah. a normal neutral position. Then yeah. put your put it yeah. in a velocity yeah. of you the way you are, right. the way you really are. You know, uh, for a large, you're going to see the velocity spike. You're going to see, yeah. oh my gosh, how long can this artery take that? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So that's kind of one of the key points that you would make because you know you'll have people come to you or they come to me and then they say, I already had a venogram, I already have an arteriogram. Yeah. So what, so tell me, how do you answer those questions of like, no, you have to get this specific kind of scan. You know, versus like somebody who, they, they got the traditional right. arteriogram okay. and venogram. All right, so okay. it used to be, and there still is a mindset where if the doctor calls it's normal, it's normal. Yeah. Um, and I work in a primary care office, so uh, it, it's hard for the primary doctor to say, you know, that doesn't look right to me, the radiologist called it normal. Uh, then you have to try to get the radiologist to rewrite his report. Um, so the, you basically talk to the person like, look, the, the healthcare system, they're moving as fast as they can to get as much stuff uh -huh. as they can. You have to decide, is there, it's almost like the person themselves has to decide how far do they want to go with the imaging? How far do they want to go to find a problem? Yep. And, and again, I come back to, I think the Lord tells people something's wrong, go get it checked out. Even if you get a no, 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 keep going, keep going. Yeah. Till you find somebody who looks at it, takes you seriously, yeah. listens to you and, and does what, what is necessary? It, what I think a lot of it too is they're not scanning a person in the right position. Right. You know, a, you know, a classic example was like I had this guy from Norway. So he comes all the way from Norway and he's like, you know, he had a mini stroke, you know, he had a mini stroke. So then, uh, you know, he had this carotid ultrasound exam and it was, there's no significant stenosis. He had some plaque there. So his wife was there, and this was at a, This was like many years ago when I was doing the scans. So I showed the plaque, and then you, you measure the thing. Then I did exactly what you said. I just went like that, and basically it went to zero. You know, like the flow oh. totally oh, it flow shut totally off entirely. Off. Well, there's so, that and too. Then, and then it turns <laughs> out, I said, what were you doing when this happened, the mini stroke happened? He said, he called it hoeing. You know, I don't even know exactly what it is, but it's something, you know, where with the garden. Yeah. Yeah. And he was doing it like for hours. So right. he was in the very position. So at some point, the blood flow got cut off. And then, uh, yeah, just a, it was a great case. We're still in contact with him. So they've just done, he's done great. He's just doing. Right. There's a verse in the Bible that says the little foxes spoil the vine. You okay. know, we're pretty good with the big problems, but these little, like the guy does hoeing, you know, hoeing is his garden. These, but he's in a certain position yeah. that you normally aren't for hours and hours these or whatever. These are the whatever. injuries, that, that, these repetitive yeah, yeah. injuries. That's how, yeah. that's one of the ways okay. that get you, yeah. Here, I thought it would be fun if, well, do you know that Bible verse by heart that, like, I was intrigued by, you know, you, you saw an interesting case yesterday, so you, you know, you, you showed it with us. And I was intrigued that before the console even started, you read a Bible verse. So maybe explain right, why right. do you, why do you have, why do you read that Bible verse before oh, you even see something? Okay, so the verse that we're talking about is uh, in Chronicles about King Ace's death. So even when the disease became life-threatening, he only went to his doctors and would not go to the Lord, okay. therefore he died. Okay. So I do that before I go into the scans because I say in a moment, we're gonna think we're geniuses. We're gonna think we see everything, okay. we know everything, but we need the Lord to guide us on how to walk out of this thing. Okay. Uh, and 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 what is what is the what does it end up being? These repetitive injuries. Okay. Look, I'm gonna go ahead and, and fix some stuff, but you gotta stop mm -hmm. you know, you gotta stop injuring it. You gotta stop um, I had one that was a, a painter and she 
was in this closed room, didn't want anybody to see the painting until she was done with it. So there's no ventilation. So she's poisoning herself with, oh, with the point wow. paint fumes. Wow. And I'm like, well, good thing we're praying because like, Lord, what is causing this? You know, I'm not getting any better. I'm still getting better. Well, I fixed a bunch of stuff, but what's going on in your okay. life? Well, yeah, we need we need God to guide us through these things and, and because we'll get this intelligentsia spirit where we think we're geniuses because we the scans are so revealing and, and the and the ultrasounds and the technology we yeah. can really see so much till we think we know enough yeah but you got to prayerfully like what am i doing oh well, i'm sleeping funny or i i'm doing this i'm doing that you know i gotta i gotta give up too much coffee or whatever yeah. it is you know so here if anybody's watching this how can they pray for jeff middleton like what would you like prayer for wow I need to know what to go after and what to ignore. Okay. As What's a, important? As, as a doctor. Like you right. were just like, it was like Solomon, I want wisdom from the Lord. So like how to, what's actually the main problem for the person? Yeah, what do, what do I, what do I okay. go after for? What do I go okay. after? What I really, Okay. and what do I ignore? What are you most excited about, you know, doing the work you do? Uh, advancing the field. Okay. I, I, I like advancing the field, um, okay. overcoming these paradigm paralysis that, that people get stuck in and just, no, new technology, new okay. things. Oh my gosh, that makes complete sense. Um, like we had a, a, a young girl that four and a half years going to the doctors with all these different symptoms and well, you know your symptoms don't make any sense and they even put a heart monitor around her and, and then hit pause on it. Like, all right, get up. I cured you. You don't have pots anymore. I think true evil that we get exp we ex are exposed to is this intelligentsia spirit. Like, you know, your symptoms don't make any sense. Okay. So, you know, what's really going on, young lady? You oh, know, okay. Right. Uh, and you start questioning your own. Wait, what? Do oh, I, um, what, then, do I, I have I, a psychological yeah, problem? But, right. Okay. That. That's that's the that's those that's the oh, devil attacking. Oh, okay. So then, when we did the scans okay. and found out that her hyoid bone was going right between internal carot and external carotid right, right there this, and just right. shutting her down. And that's okay. that's where you push to, to shut somebody down or blood pressure down and to make somebody pass out. Okay. So, and we did a scan with her turning her head to the left and then turn to the right and it was just going in and out. And then she went to her primary doctor who was also an emergency room doctor mm -hmm. and he looked at the scan. Oh, that explains everything we've been dealing with for four and a half years. That, of course, that's, that's the problem. That's amazing. That That's it. I, I want to take these people that have been lied to and, and I want to I want to validate them and vindicate them and support them and say yeah. no God is good and there is a solution and, and the devil wanted you to think that there's no solution and just to sit there no first I got to believe that God is and then I got to believe he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him David said where would I be if I did not believe I'd see the goodness of God in the land of the living you got to believe that you're going to see God that solve this and show you the way out of this and that's man that's what excites me if you yeah know. that's awesome well that was well said what, what what would you say is like your biggest challenge as a as a doctor? To get you do these scans, you see these problems. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, the styloid is a problem. This is a problem. Getting a doctor to to do the procedures that you think you need oh, okay. them to do. I've got a wall over there. I can I show you, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I can show you basically yeah. where I talk this doctor into yeah. doing that, that doctor into doing this. It's incredible. Like we we still have a case. Probably the last time I saw it was eight months ago. We figured out she needed, like, I think it was a stent in her vertebral artery, like one of her vertebral And man, to get to find somebody to do it, like, she's still searching. Because certain things, they really should be covered by insurance. Like, you know, she has a definite, you know, narrowing. And, yeah, it's exactly, it's exactly what you said. What I like about what you do and what we do is now somebody has objective evidence of what's wrong. So then they can show that to the the neurologist and everything so we do what's called we do like little snippets i don't know if you do it we try to do little snippets like say if they got carotid or they got jugular vein obstruction from a styloid we do a snippet because then they have it then they can show everybody because you know the problem is if you just give them a flash drive you know the neurologist like they're busy so right. that's why I think the snippets are help. Like if like this is like one of your main pathologies, then they have it. It's on their cell phone, and you know sometimes to get into the doctors, it's like impossible. <laughs> like you literally, like I now have, it's unbelievable how many doctors I have to talk to. Is you know that they they won't even see the person unless they're almost assured going to get the procedure. 
like a stent right. or whatever it is. Right. Like they won't even, like in the olden days, you would just make an appointment, right. then they go over the thing. Like they actually don't even have time to just do a consult and then you're not going to get the procedure. Right. It, it seems as though the, our main job almost, or 50% of our job, is to be a patient advocate yeah, to, to help get them to the next step. Yeah. So we have to write these reports, we have to do color glossies, we make videos. We put, I mean, yeah. we put videos up on YouTube of the patient so they can show the doctor. And, but yeah, the doctor's got like two minutes and, and they won't look at a video and we have to write these reports up in a certain way. Like for example, we just talk, we just, we're all excited that we got the radiologist to do an addendum um, because he, call, he called it the way he saw it in the neutral position. Okay, can you please say, when, when the, and actually I even wrote it for him, I wrote the report for him. Look, when, you, when she brings her head down, the jugular veins are gonna get shut down bilaterally and the styloid is gonna uh, punk, risk of puncturing the yeah. internal carotid. When she brings her wow, head down. Wow, that's, that's dangerous. Yeah, and, that's dangerous. Uh, and as the styloid continues to grow, the risk of puncturing the internal carotid yeah. is, increases, Yeah. especially with a car accident yeah. or anything. And he wrote, yeah. he, he put it in. So, I mean, it's obviously that's, better. That's with, amazing. Right, so it's better great with a radiologist. On, yeah, that's a yeah. great job on that. Being an advocate, because like, to get to the next step. And of course, we've had other doctors that are all excited because we got them to work. Oh my gosh, we got the insurance company to pay for it because of your report or your pictures. Otherwise, they have to fight. Like these styloids, to get these styloids removed, yeah. you know how hard those doctors yeah. have to fight to get the insurance company to pay yeah, for it? Yeah, that's rough. Right, so. Here, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see some kids, you, you might see some kids. So the sad part is, I'm just telling you, man, the kids already got like big styloids. So for the mothers, the parents, the people who don't want to have their styloids be grown, like recently we saw a 16 year old with terrible styloids, you know, like really big styloids. Like in other words, if you go back to the medical literature prior to the year 2000, like there's almost no case reports or anything about styloids. Like it, it, like it was so rare, it'd be like, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you'd be more likely to get hit by lightning than to see an elongated styloid prior to the year 2000. Then, then we had the cell phone. Then it's like, I'm telling you now in the year 2023, it's like, we, you know, we have kids who come in with styloids. So what would you tell the parents or like, what position do you think that people are doing that's causing all the tension on the styloids that the styloids are growing? Like what, what job position or what position is it? Well, we, we're, we're seeing it and we don't even like it. Nobody likes to see their kid hunched over like this. Okay. And like that can't be good for you. Okay. Well, now we have games that can, you can be that way for yeah. hours and, yeah. and you can be, you can get lost. You think in it's it. like the chin forward or what is it? Like, is it, is it, is it, because, you know, when you do the chin forward, see how now the space goes up, mm -hmm. you know, the stylomandibular ligament. Look, physics is okay. real. Uh, okay. you, you load things a certain way, okay. the, the body's going to try to adapt and hold you upright. You can't, there are certain things you just can't do for, for a prolonged period. Okay. Without the, the body's going to try to fix that. So yeah. these styloids, I mean, there's a whole lot. Do you think it's like, it's just. It's looking. It's basically looking down and then looking forward. Right, and, and and the better our phones get, the more we do on the phones. So you're, we're going to see these repetitive things. Okay. Um, okay. And then, uh, when once SUVs became ubiquitous, uh, we're seeing more impact, more forceful impacts with people. They're getting hit by SUVs, and and we're and the oh, injuries are deeper. And, yeah. And, and they're true. they're wow, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So uh, this paradigm paralysis that we talk about. Uh, if I'm, if I'm talking to a doctor and I'm having a hard time getting through to him uh, about getting to look with fresh eyes, I'll say, hey, what color is a yield sign? You don't know on the side of the road, a yield sign. You must have driven past a few of them yeah, today. Yeah. They'll say yellow. I said, the yield signs used to be yellow up until 1976. They've been red and white for 40 some odd years and you haven't noticed because in your mind it looks this way. You learned it That's this a great way That's a and great you can't example. see the change. You know, the, the legacy system, you can't see that it's different. You can't see, okay. you're not, and, and yeah. No, that's really good. That was well said. And, yeah, we all have a little bit of cognitive dissonance yeah. that we gotta be careful and, yeah. and watch. And, yeah. and, uh, How do you make the assessment? Well, let me ask you this. Do you ever make an assessment where on the, f after you're scanning that the person is pretty much assured gonna need prolotherapy or you can't really do that on your initial assessment and when do you decide that you refer them to a prolotherapist? 
Okay, well, first I want to see if they can hold the adjustment. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see if they can't, well, what do I want to see? I want them to get better. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, That's your overwhelming answer, right, right. regardless yeah, I, whether, I mean, just who, yeah. how, whatever it takes to get them better. Yeah, I had another doctor say, you're codependent with the entire world. I'm like, yeah, I need the person to get better, otherwise I feel like it's happening to me. So I, I need them to hold the adjustment, I need them, I do, how about this, I need them. I need them to get better, I need them to change their posture, and if they can't seem to get over the hump, then all right, okay. then you need prolo to tighten up the ligaments. Um, and, and even some case, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. Okay, so it's like at some point after X amount of visits that they can't hold the adjustment. Right, and- And, and they're already oh, making the lifestyle changes. Oh, so yeah. like on the first visit, I tell them that prolo exists. I tell okay. them this is okay. a possibility. It's a possibility. I don't want you to get discouraged. You live yeah, in a day and okay. age to where all this yeah. stuff can be fixed. There's a certain amount that's your your yeah. your your responsibility, muscle tone, yeah. stopping injuring it, what falls into my jurisdiction, and then prolotherapy. I mean, obviously anything with a. Yeah. So the, I tell them right off the get get go, it's a possibility. If you have a hard time holding your adjustment, I don't want you in here every day. You don't want to be in here every day. Uh, yeah. You know there are solutions. Don't worry. The Bible talks about like hope doesn't disappoint. You know, like it's amazing. I think really bad depression and all that stuff occurs when somebody comes to the conclusion that it's not going to change. Like you can understand if somebody right. has like awful pain or terrible migraines mm -hmm. or like I have people who the sound sensitivity is so bad, Jeff, that they have to stay in their house. Like these are like social people. So you could just see like it just wears on them. So what you do and I, what we do is we you know, hope practice here. That's one of the mottos of caring medical hope practice here. So one of the things I tell them, which you probably do too, is that the prognosis is very good. And then sometimes I will say, you know, it's a year process. You know, you and I hope, you know, we do some magical thing yeah. or the person does some magical thing. But correcting structure, especially structure, like if we we're going to correct my structure, you know, it's been there for a long time, you know, so, you know, that takes time. Right. But. They ultimately got to hear God and do listen to the Holy Spirit and okay, do do mm -hmm. what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm only part. <laughs> I'm a tool, man. <laughs> no, but that's a good way to look at it. That's a good way to look at. It. Well, I just want to thank you for the interview and uh, you know we admire you a lot and appreciate everything that you're doing and hopefully together we'll have many more years of treating people together and helping them get better. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for everything you do. I mean, you've advanced the field like like significantly. Uh, I wouldn't do an ultrasound without you. I, I would. There's a lot of things I would not be doing without watching your videos too. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah. Why don't you close us in prayer? All right. Lord, we're so grateful that we have you. We're so grateful that you guide us and direct us. Uh, send us the people that will understand and that will know how to fix. Uh, just give us wisdom, and we're just so grateful that you're with us and that you care about these people so much. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother.